In today's polarizing times, with everyone always trying to one-up each other or win an argument, it's honestly refreshing when we can all come together as a culture and agree on something. And for almost a decade, one of the biggest cultural unifiers has been loving Game of Thrones. But recently, we've all come together around something a little bit different. How much we hate Game of Thrones! And boy, did we as a culture hate that last season of Game of Thrones. Hell, the petition for HBO to remake Game of Thrones' final season has been signed by over 1.7 million people. 1.7 million people? That's almost as many people as I've dated! I wish. No, I don't. Do I? Am I that promiscuous? Yet, what was most intriguing around the hate of Game of Thrones' final season was that it never devolved into echoing the more toxic fandoms that slowly built up around other franchises. In fact, when people critiqued the show, they often would praise the truly stellar acting, directing, production design, costuming, stunt work, cinematography, and practically everything else that went into the show's final season. Hell, fans actually turned their anger into a positive, helping raise over 130000 for Amelia Clark's charity, Same You, and 25000 for Kit Harrington's charity, Mencap. It's honestly kind of heartwarming, especially when you compare that to other fandoms like Star Wars, where stars like Kelly Marie Tran were harassed off of Twitter. Certainly, there were small pockets of that in the Game of Thrones fandom, but for the large part, the anger at the final season of Game of Thrones was aimed solely at the people actually responsible. The show's writers and showrunners, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. Weiss and Benioff were critiqued for failing to adequately wrap up their final season of The Cultural Phenomenon. Now, I'm not going to get into a deep critique of what was wrong with the final season because that's pretty much already been done by, well, the entire internet at this point. But to give my quick thoughts on it, the basic problem was the show shifted from having characters motivate the plot to having plot motivate the characters. Both ways of storytelling are valid, but it's not really Game of Thrones to have, you know, plot dictate where the characters go. Game of Thrones was a show where if you made bad choices as a character, you paid for them. And being the story's protagonist didn't necessarily protect you. I don't think any of the characters' choices or developments were inherently bad in the final season, but they just needed a hell of a lot more time to actually justify them, and then have those characters justify the plot beats. All except the decision to have Bran end up on the Iron Throne, or... King. I guess the Iron Throne doesn't exist anymore. And who has a better story than Bran the Broken? F***ing anyone. Anyone, Tyrion. You had a better story. Hell, I'm pretty sure this dude probably had a more interesting story than Mr. Less Emotional than a Vulcan over here. Ooh, I talked to a dude who was in a tree. Ooh. Anyways, if you want a deeper critique of the final season of Game of Thrones, I'd recommend Lindsay Ellis's great two-part video series on it. It's linked above and should be linked below as well. No, for this video, I want to focus more specifically at the criticisms focused at Weiss and Benioff themselves as writers and showrunners, and ask, is our hatred of them justified? As with everything on this channel, the answer is yes and no. God, this channel does have a consistent theme of being, well, the truth is actually somewhat complicated and somewhere in the middle. Doesn't exactly make for stirring YouTube algorithm bait. Hmm. One second. Weiss and Benioff are adults to find as a human beings and the epitome of everything wrong with Hollywood. I'm still angry about it! Ooh, <coughs> jeez, <coughs> 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 legitimately that hurt my voice. Whew. But seriously, yes, Benioff, Benioff? Weiss and Benioff are due a heavy load of criticism for their bungling of the final season of Game of Thrones. And again, check out Ellis's videos for the specifics of that. But I think it's unfair to simply write them off as bad writers, when they did at least give us four, arguably six, great seasons of TV. And no, it's not as simple as saying, well, those seasons were better because they were adapting from books and not writing stuff themselves, because that's not how adaptations work. I mean, if that were true, the Hobbit movies would have been freaking phenomenal. And sadly, that's not accurate. <laughs> And this is coming from someone who literally has a Hobbit tattoo on her shoulder. For, for the books, not, not the movies. No, what I find to be a more interesting criticism of Weiss and Benioff, and why I even wanted to make this video in the first place, comes from the question of why were these two even put in charge of a show like Game of Thrones to begin with? This criticism existed before, but really came to light last week after Benioff and Weiss appeared at the Austin Film Festival and stated things like, when they were asked by George R. R. Martin for their credentials, they admitted they didn't really have any. Certainly they had writing credentials, but they actually stated, quote, we had never done TV. We don't know why he trusted us with his life's work. They also talked about how their initial pilot, which got turned down by HBO, was full of basic writing mistakes. 
And HBO only went forward with the series because they probably had a lot of foreign pre-sales invested in the show, and HBO was probably 50-50 on even letting that go ahead as well. Betty Alf and Weiss even reportedly stated, everything we could make a mistake in, we did. They apparently didn't know how to work with costume departments or how to run such a high budget show, and were learning as they went. And right after this Austin Film Festival appearance, Weiss and Benioff announced that they were leaving their deal to make a Star Wars trilogy, citing that they couldn't devote enough time to it between that and their deal with Netflix. However, details later emerged that explained that Lucasfilm chief Kathleen Kennedy was reportedly unhappy about the Netflix deal, and was concerned that Benioff and Weiss, who were known to focus on only one project at a time, could handle juggling Star Wars and Netflix projects at the same time. And that's a fair concern. Netflix deals usually go to producers who can manage multiple projects, like Ryan Murphy, who is currently working on 10 projects like The Politician for Netflix, after only being two years into his deal. Not to mention all his other projects like Pose, 911, American Crime Story, and American Horror Story. Weiss and Benioff, in contrast, have only made 79 episodes of one show over the past 10 years. The last season of which took them two years to produce only six episodes. Big episodes to be sure, but considering the level of responsibility they'd be taking on between Netflix and THE BIGGEST FRANCHISE EVER in Star Wars, one had to wonder if they were up to it. Especially considering the bungling of the final season of Game of Thrones and their admittance to making a lot of mistakes. So after all of this news, most fans were cheering at the two leaving Star Wars. But a lot of fans were also angry at these two because they were even trusted to be put in charge of something as big as Star Wars or even Game of Thrones to begin with. Most fans, rightly, pointed out that there were tons of more qualified people who could have taken the reins. Yet, is it justified to be angry at Weiss and Benioff for perhaps biting off a little bit more than they could chew with Game of Thrones and then eventually Star Wars? Well, I'd actually say no. Can we blame two guys who were given the chance to make a multi-billion dollar TV show that they took that opportunity? No. I don't think it's fair to get angry at them for taking that opportunity that any of us would have taken in a heartbeat. I mean, if someone came to me today and said, Jesse, we want you to direct the next Star Trek movie starring William Shatner, Avery Brooks, Kate Mulgrew, and a resurrected Leonard Nimoy, I'm gonna say yes to that. And sure, while I do have some production and directing experience, I wouldn't be nearly experienced enough yet to helm that. But dang it, I would be willing to give it a try. And also, I hope to one day be that experienced enough to do that. So, of course, I want to try and do that thing. And the best way to actually get that experience is to actually do it. Which is what Weiss and Benioff did. And sure, they made some failures along the way, but failure is all part of the process of learning and growing as artists. Certainly, their failures were much more drastic given the level of platform that they had, but it's also important to remember that this is just a TV show. And it's also not as if they didn't create one of the most important American cultural touchstones of the past decade. They did have some level of success. I personally would kill to have the opportunity to fail as big as these two did. So no, while I do think the criticism of Benioff and Weiss as writers and showrunners is certainly more than warranted, and it's probably for the best that they aren't going to be running the already somewhat mismanaged Star Wars franchise, I honestly can't fault them for taking the opportunities that they were given, like running Game of Thrones or the chance to run the world's biggest franchise. However, I do think that Benioff and Weiss's career trajectory highlights a larger issue that we haven't really been talking about because we've been so focused on these two men. One of the biggest issues highlighted by Benioff and Weiss is the problem of people, specifically white men, to fail upwards. And I know, I said white men, don't get scared, I'm not attacking you white guys out there, I love you. I am gonna appear to go full SJW on you here, but I promise you, those of you who hear the word diversity and already want to run down to the comment section in anger, I just want to ask you to stick with me and then go yell in the comments. Gotta increase my watch time. But seriously, please hear me out until the end, that's all I ask. You see, there is a tendency for certain people to fail upwards. Basically meaning that people fail and yet still get to move up in their careers. Hey, you've never run a TV show before? Here, here, take one. Oh, that was the only project you've ever run and the final season was a critical flop? Well, here, take the biggest franchise ever, Star Wars, and uh, do whatever you want with it. Hey, you made a critically panned superhero movie? Well, here, you know, take another one. Oh, that one was also kind of a critical flop. You know what, here, take another even bigger one. Oh, that one too was a critical flop. Well, here, take another one. Oh, I mean, you know, we'll have Joss Whedon help you out with that one. Hey, you ran a ratings challenge reality show and mangled your family's business? How about running the entire country? 
Sorry, that last one got a little bit political for some of you. Here, let me let me be even-handed. Hey, you failed to win your race for the Senate. How about running for president? Wait, he backed out of the race? <sighs> I literally wrote this on Thursday and the next day he backs out. It's like he was intentionally trying to ruin my joke. Damn it, Beto. Also apologies to Zack Snyder. Like Benioff and Weiss, I think Zack Snyder is probably a fine person and I also like a lot of his movies, but I also think there's reason to criticize issues around him and his career. And also I am a let's see the Snyder cut person. But that's a topic for a vastly different video. Let's bring it back to the topic at hand. So getting off of larger politics, why is failing upwards a thing in Hollywood specifically? Well, admittedly, there's some logic to it. As I said, failure is part of learning, and studios often would like to go with a director who has proven that they can at least handle a large-scale production over someone who is new. Zack Snyder, for all his arguable faults on an artistic level, clearly knows how to effectively run a big-budget studio production. And it does help that he does have some financial success under his belt with movies like 300, really the only type of success that studios ultimately care about. The same goes for Benioff and Weiss, who can at least say they made a show happen and did create a huge cultural phenomenon. But like I said before, this only seems to apply to white men. You rarely see women or people of color fail upwards as frequently. Again, to be clear, I'm not attacking white men. I'm not even saying that them failing upwards is a sinister evil on their part. What I am saying, though, is that the stakes for women or people of color or queer people are often much higher because they're scrutinized much more specifically because they are seen as different. Hollywood currently, and previously, isn't exactly the most diverse place, especially behind the camera. Between 2007 and 2017, only 7.3% of directors were women, according to a USC study, and only four of them were women of color. These people often face much larger scrutiny than most. I'm sorry, I, I have to stop this video. Someone's literally playing sabotage out my window right now, and I'm like, is Captain Kirk out there? Is Chris Pine? These people often face much larger scrutiny than most. To use an anecdotal example, let's look at a recent story from Mindy Kaling, an extremely accomplished actress, executive producer, and director and writer who's worked on everything from The Office, The Mindy Project, to her recent film, Late Night. When The Office was nominated for an Emmy Award for Best Comedy Series, Kaling's name was the only producer's name dropped from the producer's list. Quote, they made me, not any of the other producers, fill out a whole form and write an essay about all my contributions as a writer and producer. I had to get letters from all the other male, white producers saying that I had contributed, when my actual record stood for itself. Quote, I was singled out. There were other office writer performer producers who were not cut from the list, just me, the most junior person and woman of color easiest to dismiss. Quote, I worked so hard and it was humiliating. I had written so many episodes, put in so much time in the editing room, just to have the Academy discard it because they couldn't fathom I was capable of doing it all. As Kaling's story illustrates, women or people of color or queer people, though Kaling isn't a queer person, face a much higher level of scrutiny than anyone else. So when a woman or a person of color or a queer person makes a project, they're often seen as representing their entire gender or race or sexuality. So if they're a success, that's great. We've now proved that their identity can be successful. I mean, how many times do we have to hear, oh my God, look, this proves women can make things. We heard it with the female directed Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman, for example. Despite women being integral directors in Hollywood, going all the way back to the 1920s and 30s, with the likes of Dorothy Asner, Leonard Kofi, Anita Loos, and Janine McPherson. Yet when someone of a specific identity fails, it's often seen as representative that their entire identity isn't really what people are looking for right now. Audiences just aren't ready for a woman-led comedy. The failure is often placed on the identity, not maybe the fact that the product was just bad regardless of who made it or who was in it. And I'm not saying this happens for every film, and I'm not saying that Hollywood doesn't exacerbate this at times with something like the Ghostbusters reboot, which they really put front and center that, look, it's a women-centric film, and so when it failed, it failed on those terms and just kind of made everyone upset. Yet, this same logic that I've just been talking about isn't applied to productions like Game of Thrones or Batman v Superman. It's just Weiss and Benioff made a bad season or Zack Snyder made a bad movie, not maybe audiences don't want to see a straight white male superhero right now. I mean, could you really imagine anyone saying that? Now, I think it's really important not just to make that criticism and end the conversation with, well, Hollywood's just sexist and racist and end it there. That's just somewhat lazy criticism and only really part of the story. So what is the full story? Well, everyone in society harbors some internalized biases. 
mostly against women, people of color, or queer people, because that's just the messages that we get from a lot of our culture, both in politics, the news, and in our media that we consume. Even women and people of color or queer people have these same biases even against ourselves. And again, just as I've said in other videos, just because you have that bias or maybe say something sexist on accident or do a sexist action, that doesn't make you somehow a total sexist or racist or a bad person. Certainly, sexist and racist people exist, but for the most part, we all just have internalized messages and biases and sometimes act on those biases. For example, I'm transgender and bisexual, and I'll fully admit that sometimes I am transphobic and homophobic in small ways. I often screw up gender pronouns, even for myself, and even found myself still feeling mildly uncomfortable seeing two men kiss each other, for instance, in public until maybe only a few years ago. I only started to get over that stuff because I was exposed to it more and more by being in a city and a community that had a lot more queer people in it. And I was able to really analyze where my feelings of uncomfortability were coming from. This all goes to my larger point of not dismissing the issues surrounding the treatment of women or people of color or queer people in Hollywood or elsewhere in our society, but to say that it's often not some big conspiracy to destroy or attack women or hurt women of color or queer people. Again, certainly, those people exist and definitely exist in Hollywood. Men like Harvey Weinstein who actively hurt and attack women, for example. But on the whole, a lot of the reasons that so much scrutiny or dismissal is placed on minorities just comes from more subtle internalized biases. And these biases are heightened because the people in charge are quite often also not women, people of color, or queer people. As I stated before, over 90% of executives, directors, and showrunners in Hollywood are white men. And because of that, these men often just aren't aware of the struggles that minorities face due to the fact that most of the people above them don't understand their struggles. It's kind of a loop there. We couple that with the fact that everyone always is more biased to like or hire people that they have more in common with. And sadly, in a world where race, gender, or sexuality is considered an important distinction, we often are less likely to instantaneously see a commonality with someone of a different gender, sexuality, or race than we would someone of the same gender, sexuality, or race. I mean, I do the same. I mean, if I walked into a room right now, and it had a straight guy in it and a trans woman in it, I would naturally assume that I would have more in common with the trans woman, just instantly. But as I got to know them, maybe I'd find out that the straight guy and I both love Star Trek and would easily get along more. But often, in things like hiring, you don't get a ton of time to know someone. So even the smallest nudges towards finding commonality can make all the difference. So with most people in charge being white men, they tend to hire more white men because they see themselves in each other. Again, this isn't me condemning somebody for doing that. It's a completely understandable human reaction. But when that's played out over an incredibly large system like Hollywood, eventually you see the large scale effects of that small-scale feedback loop. So it places women, people of color, and queer people in a double bind. They can't get hired because they face more scrutiny as women, people of color, or queer people when they have less experience. But they're less likely to get that exact experience because they are women, people of color, or queer people. See how that all becomes an unfortunate catch-22? So going all the way back to Benioff and Weiss, I know, right? That was a while ago. On a small scale, it's completely understandable that they would take the opportunities given to them and that the opportunity was given to them by people who saw themselves in these two creators and decided to take a risk on them even though they knew they were less experienced. And then that experience that they earned from this opportunity leads them to larger and larger opportunities, even if they fail, because now they've proven that they can actually execute these scale of productions. And then people like Benny and Weiss perpetuate this cycle by then hiring people like them. For example, it's important to note that Benny and Weiss didn't hire practically any people of color or women writers for Game of Thrones, with only one woman writing a few scenes for the series, for example. So it's clear to see that this positive feedback loop is rarely afforded to anyone else of other identities. And it's hard to talk about that because, again, whenever we do talk about it, we tend to fall into statements like, Men are trying to put down women, or you're racist for not hiring black people. To be clear though, I don't want to diminish the very real harm that things like sexism or homophobia or racism, especially systemic racism and sexism, do. 
And I don't mean to say that there aren't much more intentional and larger agendas of racism, homophobia, and transphobia, and sexism going on. These things certainly do exist in Hollywood, and especially elsewhere, like in politics or the criminal justice system. Not just in terms of high-profile cases like Weinstein, but even in smaller-scale ways, such as actively choosing to not hire a queer person because they are queer, for example. By focusing this video on what I've labeled as a more understandable yet still damaging acts against minority groups, I by no means wish to give the impression that it's all just the misunderstanding on both sides, because that isn't true. Yet, often when we discuss the large-scale issues like that, which are important to talk about and break down, it loses discussions like this in the weeds. I think it's also incredibly important to analyze smaller-scale acts removed from the larger hyperbole around these topics that only tends to further polarize everyone instead of helping us all learn. We need to discuss the issues of internalized biases that we all have, mixed with the human desire to hire based on commonality. And the only way to combat that is if we all just start to become a little more aware of it and start to investigate our own internalized thought processes. So for all of you out there, I leave you with two major thoughts. One, remember that for the most part, all of us may harbor internalized biases that may lead us to make racist, sexist, or homophobic actions, even those of us who are part of that minority group. But even if we do make those actions, we aren't inherently bad people. But what it does mean, and this is my final point, is that we all must take moments to ask ourselves what our biases are, and self-reflect on how our decisions may have larger ramifications down the line. While this certainly won't solve everything, by just perhaps recognizing that you may have a bias towards maybe white men, even if you don't realize it, and maybe taking steps to just be conscious of it, can have radical positive effects in the long term for everyone. But in the end, even if we don't agree on that, at least we can all agree on F*** Bran is king! F*** that! Alright, so I hope everyone enjoyed this video. Uh, this was just a quick one that I wrote, so I didn't have as much time to edit it, which is why it's a little less... Uh, fully edited as my other videos. So I'd love to hear all your thoughts down in the comments below. And if you like videos like this and want more discussions, please remember to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single video that comes out each and every Friday and sometimes even in the middle of the week if I have time. And also, if you wanna help make these videos even better, please give to my Patreon page just like these fine folks did. It honestly really helps make these videos better, helps uh, me pay the bills, and honestly just helps me feel motivated and helps create a sense of community on this channel. So thank you to everyone who gave to my Patreon page and I hope that you may give to my Patreon page as well if you haven't. And special thanks to my commander level and above Patreons, Steven Schuhart, Michael McGee, Maggie Evans, Lal Lindley, Wellington Marcus, Munir Amlani, and BBD. Thank you so much. It, it honestly really means the world to me and the fact that you guys gave at this level, it just, it honestly shocks me and humbles me and just thank you so much to you and to all my other Patreons. But regardless of if you do or if you subscribe, I hope that all of you, as always, live long and prosper.